Coming up on Smart Tech Today, Matthew Casanelli and I talk about the absolute winner in the smart speaker market. It's probably not going to surprise you. Plus, Siri is answering your election questions, so we put some of the smart assistants to the test. And Google Nest devices are getting more security features. Hey, any more security features for those devices that are in our home are a good thing. Plus, the projects that Matthew's working on this week, including a little button that seems to power everything, and our picks of the week. You aren't going to want to miss it, so stay tuned. Smart Tech Today is brought to you from LastPass Studios. You're focused on security, but are your employees? LastPass can ensure that they are by making access and authentication seamless. Visit lastpass.com slash twit to learn more. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This episode of Smart Tech Today is brought to you by Zapier. Zapier connects all your business software and handles the work for you, so you can focus on what matters most. Right now, through the end of the month, go to zapier.com slash stt for your free 14-day trial. And by Casper. Casper is a sleep brand that makes expertly designed products to help you get your best rest one night at a time. Get $100 towards select mattresses by visiting casper.com slash STT and using the promo code STT at checkout. And by ExpressVPN, protect your online privacy with one click. Yes, it's that easy. For three extra months free with a one-year package, go to expressvpn.com slash STT. Welcome to Smart Tech Today, where we explain the exciting, the dynamic, and, well, the sometimes confusing subject that is the Internet of Things. I am Micah Sargent. And I'm Matthew Castanelli. And today, we have news, we have projects, and we have questions. Beow, 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 beow. <laughs> What are those called? Airhorn, airhorn, airhorn. That's it. Uh, and I'm excited. I'm excited for the the show today. And yeah. uh, I think you are too. Maybe. Huh? Yeah. I missed it last week, so yeah. it's nice to be back. Yeah. Is that a real plant behind you? Uh, this one. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Nice. Didn't... It's not dead yet. So. What is it? <laughs> uh, I think it's a cast iron plant. Okay. Ooh, it's looking pretty. Uh, maybe it's kind of dead. <laughs> it doesn't it's look looking dead a little here. brown on the tips, but uh, As- I'll fill it up with my water after this. <laughs> Aspidistra elatior, uh, yes. the cast iron plant or bar room plant, is also known in uh, Japanese as haran or baron. It's a flowering plant. I didn't know. So, have you had it flower? Maybe all? that. No, maybe that's. It could be wrong. I don't know. We got it at a uh, um, horticult really place mm-hmm. i don't know how to say that that sounds right <laughs> um, in in berkeley um and then the other plant definitely absolutely died so this one's been holding out for a while now um yeah, yeah that one's I, looking pretty good it was an experiment and it didn't half of it it was uh i got results let's say and lessons learned Le- uh, there you go you know sometimes you got to kill a plant to li- live a Make a plant. Something something like that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's the first lesson of today's episode of Smart Tech Today. You know what you need is like a smart plant. Uh, yeah, smart. that's what I was going to say. Like a water tracker thing. Yeah. I, I wonder if they have those. Smart plant. Because you could do... Okay, so be let's be clear. <laughs> um, you can use uh, a... a Eve sells a device that you connect to your Mm. uh, garden hose that can then turn on and off the water. And so you could set up a system. And in fact, I believe on uh, the Eve Home blog, there is a a whole article that shows you how to set up a home watering system uh, to... And I'm, I'm going to try to find it so that folks have it. We'll uh, link it in the show notes. Um, but it tells you how to set up sort of a back patio garden kind of deal where mm-hmm. it will actually water your lawn or water your flower beds. Yeah. Okay, nice. Automatic multi-zone lawn and flower bed irrigation made easy. Wow. Yeah. Ooh. Ooh, ooh, ooh. So there is... 
Aha, here it is. This is the one I was actually looking for. This app-based automated watering system for balconies and patios is mm -hmm. simple, stylish, and saves money. And so you basically start with your Eve. You get some of these um, Gardena... Uh, watering system tubing yeah. and you connect it to the Eve and then you let the Eve do the magic. So you can do it based on Sometimes. humidity outside. You can do it based on the, uh, the, the temperature, those kinds of things and set up a whole system. But it'd be nice to have sort of like those little glass globes that yeah. you can stick in. That's what I was thinking. Like I've seen stuff like that before, but I don't see immediately like super popular ones. Um, so maybe we'll have to do research for a future project. Yeah. Although I suppose isn't part of the <laughs> point of having a plant that you're keeping it alive by remembering it. Yeah. Or I, I also just want it to stay alive. If just I just in general, it. it's kind of like, sure, I guess, but also like you could just get something to help you remind, like keep it alive. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I guess, I guess it depends on the, the point. What's your, what's your goal in yeah, having a plant? I want it to just like be real in the room. And I mean, I do like the part of like seeing it grow, I guess mostly so far they've just been kind of getting more and more brown. So <laughs> I, but it's like, it is hard to just keep track and like know when it's actually dry and stuff like that without checking it regularly. Yeah. So Maybe you're just better at it or more natural than I am. <laughs> I've got three plants right now. Um, I've got a, uh, I'm growing garlic shoots because they, they're like, they're basically scallions, but they're garlic and they just keep growing and growing and growing and growing. And I love to throw them in all sorts of food because every food that is savory is helped by garlic. I think, um, I'm not going to put garlic in my apple pie, but. Uh, everything savory definitely can be helped by garlic. So those little garlic shoots are very good. Um, I have a, uh, oh goodness, a spider plant, which I think everybody needs to have in their life and in their home because spider plants are awesome for the fact that they're constantly making babies that you can then give to friends who can then grow yeah. spider plants. And I think that's, that's so what fun. I was thinking. Um, so when my spider plant makes a baby, I'll send yeah. one your way. Sure. Uh, cause I, what my and goal I'll try is to keep to, it alive. <laughs> yeah. My goal is to hang it. I want it to be a hanging plant in front of my window right now. It's still small and I'm sort of growing it out. It was a baby when it was given to me by my partner. Um, and then I have a succulent that I rescued. I went out to, uh, there's a place called Van Damme state park hmm. and I went to Van Damme state park and bear with me. Just, just hold mm -hmm. on. Um, I went to Van Damme State Park and we were sort of at this cliff overhang looking out onto the ocean. And there was a piece of succulent that someone must have stepped on because it had uh. broken off from the succulents that were sort of all along this, this area. And so I thought, oh, do I let it die or do I try to resuscitate it? And so I took it and I put it in my nice. pocket. I'd say that's I fair. took it home. And yeah, it's doing really well now. It's grown like three sizes. Yeah. And yeah, I'm really happy. You saved it instead of it dying. Yeah. So the so net. Hopefully net that's win. okay. Yeah. Forest cops. I'd say like the, what's the do no harm? Yeah. For forest like, do no harm. Thing? Yeah. So. Which is you, a rule for you did doctors. More than that. But you went. Yeah. <laughs> I thought there was, I, see, I saw something on a camper once. Oh, that I was like, gotcha. Oh, yeah. Maybe there is. Yeah. I don't know. Um, yeah. So that's that. But uh, <laughs> I'm glad your your plant is doing okay, and I hope it continues to grow. And if it is flowering, I'd love to see the flowers. <laughs> Apparently, spider plants can flower too, uh, but they take a lot of time to do so and a lot of love and care. Okay, so let's get into things. Uh, up first, it's time to talk about Amazon and its smart assistant uh, and its smart speaker. So you may have heard, I don't know, maybe, about the Amazon Echo uh, I have to be careful when I say that because at home, my devices are triggered by the echo keyword as opposed to the standard uh, yeah. one, um, which I'm going to change, I swear. But 70% of the folks who own smart speakers in the United States own Amazon Echo devices. That's huge. That's a huge market. Yeah. That's, it's dominating. Well. <laughs> and then Google has 30 two percent ish and apple is down at 18.4 so oh, and, and they're like they i'm sure other also oh, wait, involves, no, yeah, that's, yeah other, that's just other in general so any other smart speaker on the market that includes microsoft's very brief dabbling in making a smart speaker well they didn't but the the one that supported cortana uh falls into that group as well yeah that's wild to me it's it's interesting to see google is just 
ever so slightly climbing up, just barely, just barely each year. They went from uh, 31 point seven in twenty or sorry, thirty point four in twenty eighteen to thirty one point one in twenty nineteen and are now at thirty one point seven. Um I don't understand how I guess they're just extrapolating based on the given data, but I don't know about you. I just seem to remember in my math class and science class that you never extrapolate based on the given data. <laughs> uh but the extrapolation suggests that in twenty twenty one uh, 32% will be using Google's devices and 68.2% will be using Amazon's devices, which interestingly, that's down from in 2017 of the folks who use smart speakers, 82.4% used Amazon's devices. That's a huge number, huge uh, yeah. grab of the market. And I really don't see anybody else coming along right now to unseat that. I mean, they keep making devices in all sorts of different sizes and, and scopes and uh, use cases that satisfy all of the folks that want to have smart speakers in their homes. I'm looking at another article too that breaks out the smaller parts mm -hmm. and uh, like Amazon sold 15.8 million shipments uh, shipments I guess so not necessarily all to consumers but then Apple only had 2.6 which is 4.7 percent of the market share for home pods so <laughs> not doing I mean it's like the price difference is probably like a huge factor in all of that the fact that you can get an echo for twenty dollars and a home pod costs 300 yeah. probably. Yeah, probably it's, affects things. It's but, hard to um, make a move, in the, and and Google too. I mean, it makes sense because they've got the different sizes of of uh, the Google Nest hubs and Google Nests and Google Nest circles. <laughs> all their all of their Google Home products. Um, it, it certainly makes sense that they have made a little bit of a dent. But yeah, um, this makes me wonder though, because again, we're looking at we're not looking at just U.S. folks in general. We're looking at smart speaker owners. I'm curious what the what is 100% of the smart speaker ownership in comparison to the population of the United States. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I'm curious yeah. how small or large the smart speaker ownership is uh, because I do see echoes in a lot of places mm -hmm. and not just techie people's homes. Um, but... Oh, yeah. They, you know, that that's still within my sort of uh, orbit. And I need, I'd love to know the greater picture oh, of who has them. At least, I mean, I think the one thing that's hard is that they're multi-user devices. And even I would say that like an Echo probably is more of a single person or, or depends kind of like the Echo Dot individuals have them mm -hmm. in their spaces versus like one shared of the larger speakers. But it does say... Um, there was 55.7 million shipments up from 38.5 in 2018 fourth quarter. So okay. that's a up 44%. So I think it's like, it is kind of one of those things where in the past couple of years, or it's like, when are, when is voice stuff really going to be there? And I feel like it's probably like super common now, yeah. at least to have one, especially just like you got, I mean, I signed up, I got like a free Google home mini just <laughs> for like I switched to the Spotify family account for like one month and then switched back. Yes, that's true. It's hard. To, I mean, I, I can't remember who was talking about it, but somebody recently was kind of noting, you know, you go to Amazon, you buy something and they practically want to throw a dot into the cart. Yeah. And so like, you <laughs> open up some cabinet in your home that's full of unopened dots that you just sort of <laughs> frisbee to all your friends and family. <laughs> and so they, they I mean, they're kind of being smart about, uh, about, yeah, exactly. Oprah style. <laughs> uh, they're being smart about the ubiquity in a way that other uh, companies are not. And so it's very easy to, to sort of get people into it. And then, that, you know, no, there's no small thing to be said about them uh, having the Whole Foods partnership. Mm -hmm. That is, or not partnership, but ownership. Oh, I haven't um, done that yet. Like where you, because you can just order from Whole Foods in like an hour and stuff like that with the Echo. I guess I, my friends just did the ordering part and I was mm -hmm. like, I should try it with the... Yeah. Well, I mean, just the fact that they own those stores and they can sell the, and they do mm -hmm. sell Echo devices in those stores, <laughs> it gives people an opportunity who would not otherwise be exposed to it. They're exposed yeah. to it. Oh, and I do want to follow up because it was on this show that I complained about my uh, Prime Now delivery that time. Oh, yeah. Um. I guess the person that I spoke 
to to whom I spoke the first time uh, did not actually do their job in filling out the request for a refund because I waited more than the three to five days. I think I waited hmm. 10 days just to give them the benefit of the doubt. Yeah. And when I called again, they said, oh, there was no record of them requesting a refund on your account, uh, weird. but I'm definitely doing that now. And please look for the confirm confirmation email to see that, you know, I've actually gone and done that. So I got that. And then the next day I got a message saying, this is, it, it did it itemized and it was like this is being refunded and the reason why is because item not received this is and it went through the whole thing nice. and then the day after that i got the credit so three days was really i was yeah it was really great once it actually yeah. went through it was pretty great so that made me happy um i said i wasn't ever going to order from them <laughs> again and i really tried hard not to but then i decided to tr give them another chance and uh i just was <laughs> never I, say never never say never exactly i use some capital letters to point out the exact where this needs to be delivered <laughs> and um yeah that they seems were, to have worked they made, yeah. they made it twice yeah i've ordered twice since then since then. <laughs> <sighs> it's just so like convenient I totally, I mean, I, I think I, this morning I tweeted something about like, I'm going to cancel my membership to this. And then I deleted it because like, I'm not going to actually do that. I'm going to complain about it, but I'm not going <laughs> to, I'm not going to cancel it. Oh Lord, we're bad. <laughs> we're bad people. No. Um, but yeah, that, as far as the, the echo goes, I'm not surprised that they are owning the market. It's very, uh, very obvious that they really mm -hmm. have figured out, I think what happens to be right now, the correct formula for uh, smart speakers. So we'll see if that continues and if anyone can come in with something that's reasonably priced to sort of uh, beat them out. But I don't think Google's going to do it. I don't think it's going to be Google that does it. I don't know mm. if it, I don't know if it's going to be Apple that does it either, but I just don't yeah. see Google doing it. Um, could be wrong, though. Prove me wrong, maybe Google. Come at me, maybe bro. Maybe it's wise. Maybe it's know. wise. You know, it is <laughs> a wise choice to move on to our next topic. Uh, <laughs> And that is, I am wise. Uh, I'm just joking. <laughs> because, yeah, the wise band is coming soon, but they are also known for yeah. getting majorly hacked, which this story that we're linking to notes <laughs> right at the top, too, which is funny. And uh, um, it's worth noting that it also is integrated with ALEXA. So they can't be their own smart assistant because they work with the uh, yeah. Amazon smart Fair. assistant. I guess I was referring to the speaker itself or something. Yeah. So this uh, Wise has a new fitness tracker slash wrist. I mean, it's just a smart. It's a smartwatch. It's a smartwatch that is um, is in cahoots with uh, <laughs> Amazon. So you can you know do smartwatch <laughs> things and have your your uh, different activities tracked. But then it also happens to work with. A L E X A. Now, this is not, of course, a an absolutely going to happen kind of product. It's a rumor as it stands, um, and you know that's noted in the article that uh, Dave Zatz of Zatz Not Funny um, got some information from the Federal Communications Commission filing, and also a beta app that exists for the. Well, they, it says it in their. Um, they have a blog post too that says that like. They're doing a wise in the beta te beta testing phase right now. Um, oh, so they have mentioned the wise band. I didn't see that part. Yeah, it's like a, on their community page. Oh, I see. Okay. It's, yeah. Yeah. Right now, it's uh, like nine tenths through um, beta testing before it gets to EA prep. It's in the game. <laughs> um, that was an EA reference for those folks who don't know what I was doing there. <laughs> oh, um, I, I that is like. EA Perfect Sports. It's in the game. Uh, and so, yeah, this is cool. I, it's really interesting that they're also doing a, a, a smart scale. They kind of want to have mm -hmm. everything, it seems. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's. I don't think I've seen the concept of like a fitness tracker that's also paired with what your smart stuff does so specifically, yeah. like your smart home gear. And it's kind of an interesting angle because it's like the same general realm it, it's especially just even doing this show 
it's so much a little bit like crosses lines where it's like smartwatch. Is that smart home stuff and things right. like that? Is but it, it is- smart things in general? Yeah, that, that can be a, a tough call there. So this will be interesting. And I think too the mm-hmm. uh, one of the things I want to note that I'm just now seeing in this page that you shared uh, this blog post. So wise cam uh, is one of the first products that Wise introduced, and it's a pretty popular for the fact that it is not an incredibly expensive product. It's a uh, wireless camera that you use to, uh, you know, monitor things. It's like a security camera or mm-hmm. just any sort of camera that you want to set up. And uh, Wise kind of made headlines for being that popular, uh, low-cost option. Um, but the one of the features that was part of the original. Uh, package was person detection. And the way that it worked, um, it basically was a licensed third party service that did the person detection uh, for Wise. Well, that company was recently acquired by Apple. And because of its acquisition, uh, it no longer could provide Wise with the person detection software. So Wise cameras had to drop person detection from the offerings of their camera, which in some ways made the products, made the cameras uh, less valuable to people. And they are working on, it seems, their own version of person detection, person detection version two, that is in alpha testing right now. So that is exciting. Um, that eventually WiseCam will be offering person detection again, and hopefully it's internal, meaning that they don't have to rely on other companies that could be scooped up by bigger companies like Apple. Yeah, I'm so, I'm, these are fascinating. Like, I want to see all of this come through because I like the smaller competition, like, beefing up. I mean, I guess Absolutely. they're still partnering with them, but like more competition is always going to be important, especially when there is such a dumb, I mean, there, I guess they are pairing with, um, Amazon's lady. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to not actually say it this time because I keep doing that. <laughs> Amazon lady. I like that. Um, but they, I guess they will. Does that count as part of the 70% of the market type thing? I don't know. Oh. I guess not. That's Amazon echo specifically. Okay. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, Well, uh, let's take a quick break before we move on to some more news, uh, because I want to tell you all about Zapier. Zapier is a beautiful service for automating all of the things in your life. Now, if you're growing a business, you know that that is not an easy thing to do. And you, as you're growing the business, don't want to be wasting hours every day moving data from emails to spreadsheets to your CRM to wherever you need it to go. Shouldn't that just happen? Well, that is what Zapier does. That's how it can help. Zapier has more than 2,000 apps and is the easiest way to automate your work. Focus on what matters most by connecting all your business software to engage your leads instantly. You can automatically import new customers. You can even notify your team about opportunities. And Zapier is more customizable because they support multi-step Zaps. So with that ability to support multi-step apps, you can have one thing happen, then another thing happens, then another thing happens. This gives you so many possibilities, they're pretty much endless. You can build the solution you need in minutes. There's no more wasting your time on tasks that you know could be automated, because that's exactly what Zapier was built to do. You head to zapier.com slash stt to connect the apps you use most and let Zapier take it from there. And best of all, it's easy to build the exact solution you need in minutes without writing code or asking a developer for help. In fact, that's one of my favorite things to do whenever I was setting up my Zapier account. And this has been years ago. I used them long before they ever were a sponsor on Twit because Zapier has so many cool options. I went in, I said, these are the services and apps that I use. And then it said, okay, we know you use these things. Here are some things you can do do with those services and apps. It was awesome. I could click on something and create a zap very quickly and uh, get all sorts of things set up. There are more than 4.5 million people who are saving an average of 40 hours per month, a whole work week per month by using Zapier. We use it here at Twit for all sorts of things. Like I said, I've used it personally uh, to be able to, for example, uh, there were certain photos that I wanted to show up on my website. 
that I didn't want to show up in uh, other places. So if there was a photo that I posted on Instagram, and I don't necessarily want every photo that goes on Instagram to go on my website. I just want the ones that feature my dogs because I've got a chihuahua.coffee domain name. So I was able to use Zapier to say, hey, if this, uh, if this photo has a certain tag, then go ahead and show it on my website by basically sending it over. And that involves a lot of complicated stuff normally, but Zapier was just as simple as setting it all up and making it happen like that. Super easy uh, with Zapier. So you out there can make more time to grow your business or uh, set up photo transformation and, and delivery services. Right now through the end of the month, try Zapier for free by going to zapier.com slash STT. That's Zapier, Z-A-P-I-E-R dot com slash STT for your free 14-day trial. Zapier.com slash STT. Thanks so much to Zapier for sponsoring this week's episode of Smart Tech Today. Ah, so this is kind of a slippery slope uh, that mm -hmm. I'm glad Apple is being brave about. Uh, Siri <laughs> is going to answer your election questions. Bum, bum, bum. <laughs> this just makes me sweat. I guess me sweaty palms. Like, what if you get something wrong? Who do you blame <laughs> in that situation? I mean, it all depends on the data, I suppose. But at least she's not <laughs> she's not recommending who to vote for. That's or true. Like that. <laughs> yeah, I wonder what happens if I ask that live on the show. Siri, who should I vote for? Oh, you said hey. <laughs> That's a very personal decision. Huh? Okay, so I'm sorry that I said hey, boo boo, um, <laughs> and we'll hopefully bleep that out there at twenty four twenty seven in. Let me make a note there. <laughs> um, but I do want to note here that Siri, upon asking that question, says that's a very personal decision. And then underneath it provides a link and it says you can register to vote at vote.org. Very clever, Apple. Good work. I'm proud of nice. you. That's, that's a good answer. Do we have an Android device nearby? I didn't bring mine today. Darn mm. it. I want to see mine. Wait, do you have? Do you still have your Google Home? It's in the closet. I can. Oh, the. I have a. Yeah, Echo. ask that one, but maybe mute um, yourself whenever you say the trigger word. Yeah. Okay. One second. Okay, I muted it too much. <laughs> Here, one second. Who should I vote for? She said, that's for you to decide. That's for you to decide. Hmm. I guess there's no link because there's no interface. Right. Yeah. It's kind of hard <laughs> to do that without an interface. Okay. That's, you know, that's, um, yeah, that's for you to decide. Okay. Uh, yeah. Anyway, I think this is a pretty cool feature. Uh, this was not always available. Apple um, has made a hub in the Apple News app for mm -hmm. everything to do with the elections here in the United States. For those of you outside the United States who watch the show, I promise we won't talk about the election for too too terribly long. Just to yeah. note that no um, opinions. <laughs> Apple, yeah, no sure. opinions there. Apple has uh, an has the news app, which provides a bunch of information on uh, the elections that are taking place, who's doing what and where, who's winning winning what and where. Uh, but they also have the ability to ask Siri now um, how the elections are going, essentially, which is nice. Well, especially like their example of when are the California primaries is like months and months earlier than it has been in the past. So that kind of information does change and isn't just always consistent. So that's always helpful. And um, Amazon also will do the similar. They have like a whole <laughs> they have a page where they're like, we're not telling you anything, <laughs> making it clear that it's just information also. Um, I'm assuming Google's just knows because Google already does that and they have their own um, like civic API where you can get information about this type of stuff programmatically. I remember trying to, um, I made a shortcut in the past that I don't think works anymore that... Um, basically like uses your phone number. Oh, actually I think it does work. I can put it in the notes. Um, it uses your zip code to find like your representatives and their phone numbers so you can immediately call them, which is oh 
helpful just because it's like if there's any barrier to talking to your representatives, it's not knowing their phone number or something like that. I mean, I think I have it with email addresses too. So I guess Siri shortcuts can also do it. <laughs> there you go. That's nice. Um, all right. Let's see. Yeah, let's... I, I just realized that it's like Siri's been able to do that if, if you put it together. But... <laughs> right. If you do the work. Uh, and then, of course, uh, speaking of Siri shortcuts, um, having these uh, different features to uh, sort of get you deeper into apps, I think it's kind of neat that you can um, send emails in this way. Uh, so, so Gmail used to not feature support for uh, Siri shortcuts, but now if you are a constant Gmail user and you use the Gmail app to send emails and you want to use Siri to send emails, then you can now. Is that essentially what this is? Because I have to say, sometimes Siri shortcuts confound me and perplex me and there's no better person to be asking than Matthew, the shortcuts <laughs> guy, Casanelli. Uh, so what exactly, how is this different from me not having it? <laughs> what does this do? I mean, it would have to go through the mail app natively, um, normally. Um, so, which does have like, there's a save to draft feature in that, but it basically, now you can just like open into Gmail when you, when you want to send it. Cause people probably want to use like the Gmail features or it's just the one you're using by default uh, or not by default, but we'll get to that in a second because that's another one of the stories. Um, but yeah, it's basically, it's just like a simple send email thing. So you can paste in your text and it'll get sent out through the Gmail app instead of the mail interface. I guess that does sound very duplicative, but when you just like try, if you are a Gmail user, using a Gmail action makes the most sense versus like trying to go out through like that's one thing that's also confusing about shortcuts on um, for calendar apps is that you don't actually need any because there's calendar actions and everything works through the system level of your like on iOS calendars are part of the system and then mail is also and so technically you don't need something like this but I just love seeing Google actually adopting Siri shortcuts stuff because it just seems like something they should they would never do but right. in theory they want to give the best experience to their users regardless of which platform it is so yeah well what I, go ahead oh no i was just going to say i want to see more of that i do too and we just saw uh not too long ago a report that apple is thinking about letting users choose the default apps for their devices. So right now, um, folks who aren't on iOS uh, might want to know that, yes, you Android users have been able to choose your default apps for some time, um, but iOS users are, in a way, stuck with the <laughs> default apps for mail, for uh, for browser for other things and there are some yeah. ways to get around it for sure but you have to do things like this where you wait for the app to enable it via siri and then you can sort of get around it so it'll be interesting how apple goes forth because right now the argument could be made that you can use different default apps if the app were to support siri shortcuts yeah but i just wanted it at a, at a base level in the same way that it is on android i mean i think one thing that is interesting about shortcuts is that this when in order to implement something where there would be default apps there has to just be the technical level of how do these things work together and i don't i have no idea about this but reading these rumors this is what i thought is like i'm curious if this default app behavior is going to be powered by siri shortcuts where it's like because these actually have a hook right now or like now in the future, if they add these, they have a they could have a hook where you'd be able to move from one app into the other seamlessly, just on a technical level. Because mm -hmm. like if it doesn't exist, they have to build it in order for that to be possible. And I think that's one thing that like is interesting watching Apple over the years is you see them add a feature, and then the next year something is built on top of that, and the the original feature might not have seemed that interesting, but then it's like only possible in the future because they built that um so i'm i am like i could see like i don't know maybe 
Google knows something that we don't. And they were like, okay, once we get our shortcuts in, then we're good for the future. Like that would make sense just in the past having a dot people or developers adopting like the specific features does pay off in the future. So I would hope that these two could be tied together because then, I mean, the other half of the report is that, um, it would just be like when you ask Siri to play something, it would play through Spotify and you wouldn't have to specify or on the home pod, especially it would be a big one. I think that's probably a major thing that's holding any, if people were, are interested in the home pod, but they just use Spotify. It's like not that great of an experience. So. Right. Yeah, it could be. It's could be super interesting. I mean, I think I was listening to Upgrade um, on Relay FM, and Mike was talking about like there's a whole list of apps that he wants to set as defaults because then you're able to like send mail through Gmail without having to go through shortcuts or something like that. So it'll be. Um, I think the big thing too is like when you tap on an email address and you hit send email, it'll be like right now it'll just always pop up the mail app. So being able to actually use Gmail in that instance would be a lot better. Um, all righty. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Um, this is something you wrote, correct? <laughs> uh, oh, yeah. And this is, uh, I remember seeing you tweet about this. I tapped on the link and then immediately started doing this very thing. <laughs> um, you can, so this is interesting. It was originally set up that in iOS, you could not sort of, you if you wanted to talk to your virtual assistant, you had to speak to your virtual assistant. Mm -hmm. Then there was an option added in accessibility settings that lets you type to your virtual assistant, but it basically shut off other ways of interacting with your virtual yeah. assistant. It's like type to Siri, I think is the feature. And you um, you now have told us a way where we get the best of both worlds, Hannah Montana. Yeah, it's um, in Spotlight. If you type something into the search field and then scroll all the way to the bottom, there's a little Ask Siri button that I'm pretty sure just like nobody's noticed because it's at the very, very bottom. And I, I originally discovered this. I didn't write this in the article, but I use those other options down there so much. It's like search web search app store and then um hold on i don't have my phone open right now what's the third one the third one is search maps oh yeah search maps i don't use that one as much but um i think i started doing this because sometime in the betas like searching in the app store would never ever work or or i think when it um a t an app pops up in spotlight and i would try to press view and install it just never worked. And so I built the habit of going down there and tapping search app store, which basically it's almost like a deep link into the app store with the text into the search field already. And then in iOS 13, they basically just added ask Siri down there. And I was like, oh, this is awesome. You can just type in something, hit ask Siri, and then it'll respond with your request. And I think a big thing that is important is it it responds using Siri's interface, whereas if you just type, um, and like a, a big example is shortcuts because you can see a shortcut in the spotlight results. And, but if you tap that, you then have to tap run and then it opens into shortcuts and then runs it there. But if you use ask Siri, it's basically like you're triggering it with your voice and then everything happens in that Siri interface. So if she has questions she wants to ask you, you can respond out loud again and things like that. Gotcha. Um, or you could just type in like normal weather information and things like that. So it's super helpful because you can just like a major complaint with a lot of voice stuff for people is that they don't want to actually speak out loud just to be able to use the, the technology. And so this is like, I think Google has like typed to Google assistant for a while now. Um, I don't think Amazon can do anything yeah, like this unless nothing. you're, like you don't have the phone right. to like do it with. Uh, which so. there you can speak to Alexa from the Alexa app on your iPhone yeah. or, or Android device, but typing to it is not um, a current option. So that's yeah, that's something that I don't know. I don't know that I was going to say that maybe they need to catch up on, but really, do they? They are the biggest. Yeah, uh, I mean, the they got seventy percent of the market. Yeah, yeah point, they're kind of doing all right. I mean, they're. They're crushing the voice side of it, at least. Um, but I think a big thing is just like having the option to do both. Where and like this is slightly smoother for running shortcuts specifically. Um, but yeah, it's like 
it's very nice and I feel like nobody I mean even just down there there's like you can type something into you can basically like Google search in Spotlight and then hit search web and it'll open Google for you so hmm. super convenient there too oh yeah the big thing is um this is fantastic on iPad if you have a keyboard attached especially because you can just like do command space type in your results and then hit ask Siri and then oh, oh yeah okay sorry one more thing the final part is there's usually way too many results in Spotlight, so you can go into settings and like turn off stuff that you never want to see. Like I've always in the past be typing something and then go to hit a result and then it pulls up a contact and then I hit the person's contact and I'm in the contacts app suddenly and it's like, dang it. So I turned that off a while ago. But curate curate your spotlight if that's um like you're scrolling way too much just to get to the ask Siri button. All right. Um, well, let's take a quick break here before we round out the news with some stuff from Google. Uh, first, this episode of Smart Tech Today, it's brought to you by Casper. That's right. My favorite mattress is an online retailer of premium mattresses that are offered for a fraction of the cost. Their products are cleverly designed to mimic human curves, providing supportive comfort for all kinds of bodies. You spend one third of your life sleeping. So shouldn't you be comfortable with one third of your life? Absolutely you should. You should spend many, 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 many dollars. But Casper offers them at a fraction of the cost. The original Casper mattress, that's the one I still have because it's fantastic to this day. It combines multiple supportive memory foams for a quality sleep surface with the right amount of both sink and bounce. Its breathable design helps you stay cool and regulates your body temperature throughout the night with over 20,000 reviews and an average of 4.8 stars across Casper, Amazon, and Google, Casper is becoming the internet's favorite mattress. Now, Casper offers three other mattresses on top of just the original. There's the Wave, there's the Essential, and the Hybrid. The Wave has a patent-pending premium support system to mirror the natural shape of your body. The Essential, which is one of the best like rated mattresses, has a streamlined design at a price that won't keep you up at night. The Hybrid combines the pressure relief of the award-winning foam, but it has durable yet gentle springs. So if you kind of struggle to uh, get off the side of the bed, it feels like it's sinking down, you might check out that Hybrid with those springs that sort of provides that little more bounce there. Casper also offers a wide array of other products like pillows and sheets to ensure an overall better sleep experience. Yeah, I've got Casper sheets, the Casper pillows, the Casper bed frame, the Casper, uh, all of it, the, the box springs, the whole kit and caboodle because it's been this thing that I carry with me from new place to new place every time I've moved. And it's so simple. Just the other day, I was moving a non-Casper mattress up the stairs and it was so hard to do this big thing. It was, and the, the box springs was this full box springs. The thing about the Casper box springs that I loved is that it comes in this little, this box and you put it together piece by piece. And so it's super simple to move up and down stairs. And I had no trouble with that. So having to move this uh, guest bedroom mattress into the other space made me appreciate my Casper mattress even more. And by the way, you know, if you're worried about the uh, having this mattress and not sure if you like it, well, you can be sure of your purchase with Casper's 100-night risk-free sleep-on-it trial. Casper also offers free shipping and painless returns to the U.S. and Canada. You can get a Casper mattress today, save $100 towards select mattresses by visiting casper.com slash STT and using the code STT at checkout. If you are in the market for a new mattress, come on folks, one third of your life, you need to get a mattress that's going to treat you right. A hundred dollars off select mattresses. You go to casper.com slash STT and use our code STT at checkout. Terms and conditions apply. We thank Casper so much for sponsoring this week's episode of Smart Tech Today and for sponsoring my sleep every single dadgum night. I do appreciate you, Casper. <sighs> well, it is time to provide more security features to uh, smart speaker devices. I think this is good. Um, 
Well, and, and not just uh, smart speaker devices, but any sort of smart devices. When you know that these devices have access to different parts of your home and can control different things in your home, you really want to make sure that they are providing the most security possible. And uh, Google Nest devices are getting new features that are trying to cut down on unauthorized access. So what exactly does that mean? What, what exactly are we getting, rather? Um, I mean, I think the main thing is it's been a two-factor authentication is what they're going for. Um, and they've actually they've had it for a while. But I think what you're getting is that it's required now. <laughs> so you have no <laughs> choice. It, they're basically like, oh, just so you know, it's a security update kind of thing. But it's like, we're going to actually beat this up so that it's no longer optional. And you have to um, add two-factor now, which... I feel like I've never actually ran into situations where it's been a problem, but it's always kind of freaked me out that I'm going to eventually have one two-factor thing that I can't get into just because I, I lost the key. But of course, like you said, when it's for your home, definitely the most important. Um, yeah, like CAPTCHA... Yeah. So, in your, <laughs> yeah. This, so this is the this is the second part that I find interesting. Yeah, the the I think everybody needs to have uh, two factor authentication turned on on all of the services that offer two factor authentication. It's incredibly important. It help, helps keep you safe individually uh, from phishing attempts and things like that. But they also want to help on more widely distributed uh, attacks so that are typically automated mm. attacks. And the way that you help with that is by keeping bots from being able to access your accounts by sort of brute forcing their way in. And so reCAPTCHA, um, and in this case, reCAPTCHA Enterprise, is the most uh, sort of in-depth version of reCAPTCHA uh, that helps figure out if an automated service is being used and then only lets valid users into the service. So there are different ways that reCAPTCHA might work. Um, you know that you'll have, you, you've probably seen reCAPTCHA from uh, the select these three uh, the sidewalk buses. Or, yeah, the, yeah. <laughs> only choose the sidewalk in this. Uh, they used to look more like weird, uh, goodness, oh, yeah, like kind of painting. RGB, like... Yeah, or, I, I mean, I almost like the blind it. detection or color detection. Yeah, yeah, tests. yeah, colorblind yeah. tests almost. Um, and they would have a there. series of letters <laughs> sort of bent all around inside of them, and then you'd have to write in the letters and numbers. Uh, these days, they're a little bit more uh, in depth. But I, what I find interesting is that I get them more than most people. Hmm. So I'm very robotic. No, I think what it is is my <laughs> is my use of a uh, password service. I, whenever uh, I do my little like, keyboard shortcut to pop the password and the username in yeah. quickly, then it gets, it's like, hey, you type that in pretty quickly. Let's make sure you're you. Yeah. It's um, not just like signing in. That's yeah. A good point. So I wonder if that's what does it, which is really annoying because, yeah, I do feel that I get it more so than a lot of folks. And I don't understand. Do why. you ask people about how often they get their captures? No, I see people <laughs> type in their logins. Yeah. And just get in. And they just get right in, and it's not fair. I just want to be. A, I just want to be told I'm not a robot. You know. <laughs> I like the ones where, I think there's some that are just like we're detecting, and then I will like shake my mouse or something like that. Because there's some that are like based off of do you have like a normal movement with oh. your, on your computer and stuff like that. And I'm like, yes, it's me. <laughs> <laughs> I promise it's me. Yeah, I'm trying to um, find some uh, captchas here that they. In the documentation, um, but I'm not seeing any captures. They've so. also got like login notifications, which is just makes sense so that you can always verify that it's you. That is one of those things where I'm pretty sure every single time I log into Facebook, it's like I put in all of my codes, do everything, and then they're like, You have an unverified access to Facebook. Do you want to accept this? And I'm like, Yeah, I literally just signed it. <laughs> like, I don't get it. I don't think it's ever not done that for me in like the last few years, but I don't usually use Facebook anymore. So I haven't noticed it lately, at least. But That's good. This is always solid. It's like pushing two factor on people is good. Got the login notifications and then the advertisement for Google's CAPTCHA Enterprise in the middle of their blog post, too. <laughs> it, it is totally like 
they wrote this so that they could be like, just so you know, we have this available for right. prices. Right. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that is kind of a little bit what it feels like, huh? Um, now, this is fun. I like this article because it comes from one of my favorite sites on the web, The Wire Cutter. Um, and this is kind of how I felt when I first chose to use a smart display to cook food uh, with, as opposed to doing something else. This article was published on The Wire Cutter on February 20th. It says, I was a skeptic, but I loved cooking with the Google Nest Hub Max. Matthew, have you done any cooking with any of your uh, smart devices? Smart yes, displays? I have a regular Nest Hub previously called the Home Hub. Um, and But I actually... So this article inspired me to move it back into the kitchen because I had moved it up to my office as a test to, of it being like a YouTube device because that's one of the reasons I bought it originally. I think I mentioned it on the show too that like it's the only smart display that has native YouTube integration and I just want to be able to throw on YouTube videos and get more inspiration because that is definitely like... I will regularly watch a YouTube video from some awesome creator and be like, okay, I'm going to go make a video right now because I want to do that. So cool. I wanted to have it as easy as possible. But um, I think just the spot I put in my office wasn't the best. And so I moved this back down because I was like, I need to do more recipes. And um, the article does mention that like definitely the downside overall is that it only works with sites, like specific sites. Mm -hmm. There's a ton of them, like all recipes, Epicurious, Ones Which are that pretty use, big ones, yeah. But like uh, America's Desk Kitchen and New York Times Cooking do not. And they're like, eh, you're out of luck. Which is, I, I wish, I in general, I do just like, I know people say, I just, just use your iPad. But I, if you have one and it's like, I don't want to put my iPad in the, in kitchen, the kitchen and then get like their photo has flour all over it. and. Yeah. That is like, I'd much rather have a, a little dedicated screen there. The Echo Show in my kitchen right now has olive oil on it from the cooking <laughs> that I did last night um, from when I was making some, I think it, it, was a, it was some sort of fish. I don't remember which fish it was. Um, and yeah, I was taking a, a recipe from one of the, uh, I, I, I subscribed to one of the box services and I took the recipe card and basically made my own version of it. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, yeah, I, you know, setting timers and stuff like that was what I used it for, but it's sort of off to the side, but it can still get some of the uh, olive oil clinging to it whenever you're frying fish on the yeah, uh, pan exactly. frying the fish in the, on the stove. <laughs> um, one of the things that the Google Nest Hub, this makes me kind of want one of these Google Nest Hub Maxes is, well, first of all, I've heard that it's a very, very good um, electronic photo frame, digital photo frame to yeah. have. The display That's is really like crisp them. and pretty and clean. Um, but also, because it has facial recognition, it can tell when you approach the screen and sort of turn on when that happens. And then when you're cooking, you can use gestures to start and stop timers to, uh, you know, go to the next thing, go to the, the, go back from the thing. So you sort of can swipe your hand in front of it. You don't even have to touch it um, or even use your voice if you don't want to. Cause that's, I don't know. There's something kind of, um, oh, I don't know what the word is because I don't want to say annoying or, or begrudging. That's not the right word. Yeah. I, there's some sort of friction involved with me having to say when a timer is done, me having to shout out keywords, I mean, stop yeah. keywords. Stop. Exactly. I just want to, especially when it's just like you use all three or something like I, yeah, exactly. you have to yell at, remember which device to yell yeah, at. I've got my microwave like running one timer. <laughs> it stops after beeping for a little while. Then I've got the echo going off suddenly. And then I've got the, uh, home pod, spin in circles and yeah, it gets a little much. And those ones, I just want them to shut off after a while, really. But if not, then I would like for there to be a way for me to just be like, ah, use, and then it stops. Use the force. <laughs> yeah. Use the force. <laughs> this is I not still, the timer you should be sounding. I, I'm okay with mine not having the camera on it. Like, I think it's, it is good, but then it's just like, okay, I'm putting another camera in my kitchen now and stuff like that, that I feel like, Maybe maybe the like value cost trade off isn't totally there yet. Like that is the gesture thing would be helpful, but like uh, well, if it okay, did have like assumes... FaceTime or something where it actually became like 
the Facebook portal one again, not Facebook. Yeah. I think it is just like, I mean, maybe, maybe it does have hangouts and I just don't know. But that assumes that you are actually allowing, I feel like what, what you've just said gives a a wrong impression to listeners who are not as savvy as we are, which is that we are mostly kind of, there's a bit of a jokey joke about having a camera in your space and, Oh, that could pop. It is not recording you when you are not using it. And so there's not really a trade off until, until proven otherwise. Uh, I think it's still just like part of the decision making process or not. Like when the product just doesn't have a camera, you don't have to, even worry whether or not right. that's necessarily true or other people in your family is like that's a big the part. big that's thing what, yeah my partner like, does not like the cameras on the different devices and that that's been an issue or was an issue you know until i was able to say okay this is the good thing about with echo devices with amazon's devices each of the new devices has a switch that you can literally physically slide yeah. over a shutter to close off the camera, which I think is a fantastic yeah. addition. Does this one have that? I feel like it might actually. The Google one? The, the Nest, Nest Hub Max? Max? Yeah. Um, because with my, I, I think I've told the story here, but the original Echo, oh golly, now I'm trying to think, Echo Spot, which was the circular Echo device, it did not allow you to physically cover the camera. And yeah. I felt uncomfortable. I wanted to use the Echo Spot in my bathroom. And I felt uncomfortable having that camera exactly. with only an electronic way to turn off the camera. So what I did was I figured out the method needed to take it apart, which you basically suction cup the front of it, turn it to one side, and then the screen comes out. And then I layered a piece of electrical tape on the inside of the, of the camera, um, or the, the glass rather, in front yeah. of the camera and then put it back together because I was worried that if I just completely clipped the camera or, or took yeah. the camera out, that it would mess it up. Yeah. Be a problem when it'd go, Oh no, I'm not working how I'm supposed to or something. So it's still there, but it's just constantly blacked out and can't. And now I have all of the switches turned to deactivate the camera essentially, um, on my devices. And yeah, I mean, I do that for peace of mind, despite the fact that as far as I know, and as far as the companies tell us, these devices are not activating the cameras except in cases where we want to use the cameras. Yeah. Well, that's what I was going to say. It has built in Nest Cam features. So, like, your family can, like, drop in and look at the the kitchen stuff. So, if you have it in the kitchen, I guess. But mm-hmm. I don't know. I think it is just, like... I think it's still like whether I don't necessarily think anything's going wrong, but just like putting in a camera in a space where you don't necessarily like the smaller one just is fine. Also, like I just don't want a screen that big to the, the nice, I, I was going to say I have mine nestled next to the fruit bowl. So <laughs> it fits nicely and isn't like, I mean, the big thing is that I got to get better photos on there. Cause I'm pretty sure one of the things that we just got sick of, like seeing the same photo album for, Uh, I mean, it does highlights and stuff like that, but we just don't take a ton of new photos. So it's like I got to get more interesting stuff to show up there. (laughs) Or it would just be like a a random screenshot and stuff like that. So, (laughs) Yeah. Uh, So tell me about the Sonos... um Sonos products, because this is your wheelhouse. You've, you, you're all Sonos all the time, and Google and Sonos are sort of playing nice. Yeah. So, I mean, I guess this is not, I forgot this was another reason I moved it down there is because I just got the Sonos one, you can now set, um, Google Assistant can have your default speakers set to Sonos. So when you ask it to play music, it'll play on the Sonos speaker as well, which is like, honestly, I have a whole head to head going on right now because I like the echo that I have in there too. And that's hooked up with default to Sonos. So I think the other thing that I'm trying to figure out there is sometimes I don't know whether or not the Sonos is responding or the echo because they're both a L E X a enabled. And so like, (laughs) it's like, I've just set a a seven minute timer on your Sonos one second edition. And I'm like, okay, please don't (laughs) say the entire speaker name, but um. yeah, that is annoying. (laughs) (laughs) They're supposed to, this is one of the annoying things is that depending on the version of a L E X a that is in the device, it will or won't have proximity detection to determine which device should answer. And I had an mm-hmm. interesting situation the other day. This, 
all of the devices that I have in my home that I have ALEXA turned on on, if that makes sense, it is ALEXA services are activated on only the devices that have proximity detection. And I, uh, not too long ago, asked for something to happen. I think it was preheating the uh, uh, Amazon smart oven. And it actually followed up and said, I responded to your question, or I responded to your request from the Echo Show uh, in the kitchen. Was that the device that you wanted me to respond from, or was there a different one, essentially? So it was kind of hmm. like asking me which device I wanted That's to cool. use. And that was nice to have that sort of follow up happen. Uh, but if you don't have those, uh, the most recent version of AliExA, then it can be an issue for you to use that proximity detection and it can sort of get confused about which device it should respond from. Mm -hmm. um, Makes sense. Yeah. I feel like it, with like the Sonos part, I, I think you can only set one assistant also. So maybe I should keep Amazon's on there and then use the Google Home hub, Nest hub, <laughs> dang it, um, as the, and use that with the Sonos as the default speaker. I guess I'll, I'll have to do the face off. <laughs> it's got, it's, there's no face because they're smart speakers. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> That's okay. Well, you already took their face <laughs> off. I see. Uh, so <laughs> now I'm, now I'm lost in face off and thinking of that <laughs> stupid movie. Um, but let me get away from that stupid movie to tell you about something that is incredible, and that is ExpressVPN. They're bringing you this episode of Smart Tech Today. Lots of VPN providers out there, and you probably heard of a few. Some of you may have even used a VPN before. I recommend brands to my listeners, of course. We, we all do. We, the, the, the brands, the services, the uh, different sponsors that we have are ones that we truly value um, and we trust. And ExpressVPN is the best VPN on the market. So here's why. ExpressVPN, and this is the most important thing, this is the coolest thing, this is what makes me use ExpressVPN over the others that are out there. It doesn't log your data. Many of the cheap or free VPNs, and honestly, many of the paying VPNs, make money by selling your data to ad companies. ExpressVPN developed a technology called Trusted Server that makes it impossible for their servers to log any of your info. I remember going and doing a deep dive on Trusted Server technology from ExpressVPN just because I was dadgum curious about what it was, and I was so pumped to see how this works. Uh, so they use servers that run on RAM. That's random access memory. It is a volatile memory storage uh, solution, and that means that when the RAM is removed from power, that memory goes away. So when those servers are reset, then your data is not stored there. On other VPN services, it might stick around a lot longer because those servers are not running on RAM, so you're not getting that trusted server technology. There's a lot of other magic that works there uh, that I'd love to tell you about, but you can head to ExpressVPN's website to learn all about the trusted server technology. But genuinely, that thing alone is why I use ExpressVPN and love it because it's the one that's not logging your data. So you're truly getting that private experience. Now, after that is speed. Many of the other VPNs are going to slow down your connection or make your device sluggish. ExpressVPN does not. It is quick. You usually can notice you turn on the VPN service and then suddenly your video that you're watching sort of cuts out and then it comes back and the, the bit rate is lower and it doesn't look as good. Uh, or you're downloading something and you switch on the ExpressVPN service and it, it drops or you, you switch on the VPN service and it drops not with ExpressVPN. Uh, it continues to be super fast no matter where. Even if I'm connecting to a server that's thousands of miles away, if I'm connecting to a uh, uh, say, a, a server in London so that I can watch uh, a show that's only available in the UK, I can still stream those videos in HD quality with no lag. And the last thing, of course, that sets ExpressVPN apart from the competition is how easy it is to use. You fire up the app and you click one button to connect. It's so easy that anyone in your family or any of your friends can use it very simply. Uh, TechRadar, The Verge, CNET, and many other tech experts rate ExpressVPN the number one VPN in the world. Here at Twit, 
I'm telling you right now, I think ExpressVPN is fantastic, regardless of the fact that they're sponsoring us because of that trusted server technology. It really sets things apart. I use it all the time now. I just tap and, and turn on the ExpressVPN, and I know that I've got that secure private connection no matter what device I'm using. I'm telling you, it is incredible and so simple to install across all your devices. I've got it on Elvis, my Windows PC. I've got it here on my MacBook Pro that I guess I haven't named. How sad. It's on everything. So you out there can protect yourself with a VPN that I'm using and that I trust. You can use the link expressvpn.com slash STT today and get an extra three months for free on a one-year package. That's expressvpn.com slash STT. Visit expressvpn.com slash STT to learn more. And a genuine heartfelt thanks to ExpressVPN for sponsoring this week's episode of Smart Tech Today and my British television watching experience. We do appreciate it. Matthew, you uh, are working with some fun stuff in your in your studio, in your space, in your home, uh, and it is time for you to tell us all about it. You've got buttons and beacons and boo boos and babas. What's going on over there? I'm gonna see. I'm gonna click the button. Can you hear it? There's a little bit oh, of foley going on. Yeah. Are, well, if you're watching, you can see all of my lights changing because I've got the hue button set up. Finally, it actually. I ordered replacement batteries because if previous listeners will know that I tried to live stream it, it completely failed because it was just dead. And I didn't know that before I started. So now it's got a new one of those CR220 batteries or something like that, just the flat ones. But it's just a tiny little white button. And um, what was even nice, I was telling you before we started the show, was it almost like set itself up in a way. Like I yeah, added it this is into HomeKit's. And then um, basically it like when you go into the Hue app, then you can sync with HomeKit. And as it did that, it knew that it was in the office where I placed it. And then it just had a bunch of settings set for this. So I basically was like talking to somebody um, on a video chat and was like, oh, yeah, I finally got my button set up and pressed it and all the lights turned off. And I was like, what? <laughs> like I didn't even do anything and it was already working. But um yeah, I was talking to Chris Lawley, who has a YouTube channel, and he basically covers iPad and Siri shortcuts like I do. Um, we are going to collaborate on a future live stream and stuff. Um, but basically, he has his setup with a home automation, which then in the home automations now, you can use a function called convert to shortcut. And then he uses like a URL that sends a web request to his time tracking service. So he can literally just press a button and clock in and clock out of like his time tracker, which is pretty cool. Oh, that is very cool. But yeah, I mean, now it's just like this is my mobile office lights. And um, I think it's like as you. Uh, oh, yeah. Part of the, what was set up by default is he has like depending on the time of day, it will automatically have um, the color temperature change so during the daytime it'll be more white and as i get into the evening it'll automatically set it to be yellow and stuff like that which is is amazing like i didn't i was gonna basically try to figure out how to set that up and it just already did it by default so they've got some good engineering going on there with the basic cube button stuff um one thing to know if anybody is getting smart buttons like this um i have a set from flick also which has been doing buttons for a while um but uh, whoop, I totally just blanked what I was going to say. Oh, yeah. Um, it's <laughs> You have to set it up usually in their app or in HomeKit, but not both, where you, you add the accessory so it still shows as a button. But then all of the functions, if you customize them in HomeKit, it kind of overrides what they can do separately. Um, this is the same of the I have a Logitech Pop, which I, was, I think I was saying in a past episode I use for like... Uh, turning off the bedroom lights and turning on our sound machine. But um, that's also set up in their app because in, in HomeKit, you can only have just like single button presses. Or now I guess use, I'm going to take that back because the same convert to shortcut feature, you can have if statements and all that fanciness. So it can be like, if it's already on, turn it off. And if it's off, turn it on. But I feel like you could get into a repeating loop there or something like that. Right, yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah. It's just like on, off, on, off. <laughs> on, like that is a bit. Yeah. That becomes a bit of an issue for sure. <laughs> but like the, I'm. I think I'm probably gonna. I gotta figure out if I can save this, but I'll probably reprogram this to be my own time time tracking thing too, because then that is like. I can stick it in my little jean pocket as I go around the day <laughs> and then start and stop. Cause like time tracking is like, you want to be accurate in theory and I just tend to forget it. So having this little lump in my pocket might work. Now is, <laughs> that was weird, but, <laughs> uh, yeah, just a little bit. Um, <laughs> but whatever it takes, you know, <laughs> <laughs> um, and then the other thing that I have that I just set up, I don't actually have it with me, but I have a uh, eye beacon from uh, Blue Charm is the brand. And I got this based off of listening to, I don't remember the episode of Automators also on Relay FM, but um, they, Rosemary Orchard and David Sparks have talked about just like how you set up eye beacons to have certain proximity stuff um, happen where it basically uses the strength of the Bluetooth signal to determine whether you're close to it or not. Um, and then I have, there's an app called Pushcut that works with shortcuts. It might be Pushcuts. I don't remember. But um, then with that, you can basically, when you're within proximity of the beacon, it'll put up an alert and then you can run a shortcut from there. Or you can also have it just like automatically do something for you. So um, this app is super awesome. And I'm going to talk to the developer sometime in the next two weeks just about how this all works because it's, it's like if you thought shortcuts was confusing, <laughs> a tool that works with shortcuts can be also equally confusing. But it's the kind of fun stuff that I like to set up. And then I want I do want to like make some guides for people because it's pretty advanced. Yeah, it but. is it's a little bit more I mean, originally <laughs> this service was the the devices rather and the whole service that goes with it were created for um were created for businesses and, and things like that, the whole iBeacon yeah. system. Uh, by the way, listeners, we will include a link to push cut in the uh, in the links so that you have that as well, so you can see what that's all about. Um, but I, it does make me curious um, to try the the system. I was just on Blue Charm's website, and Blue Charm says that they are currently... Um, on a group training slash vacation. So you have to go to their <laughs> Amazon. <laughs> you have to go to their Amazon listing to do that because they're not doing uh, orders on their They're from site. Eugene, Oregon, so that maybe that matches up. They're yeah. <laughs> very chill. Yes, they are super chill there. Um, <laughs> that's cool, actually. I almost maybe I'll go up there on the way because I'm from Portland, Oregon. So Oh, that's right. Yeah, you should drive go. by. Um, but uh, they do have a place on their site that they. Yeah, they I mean, I got it from to, Amazon. So. so um, but the, uh, I mean, these are used in the Apple stores. Like when you go in and it's like, you're near the display thing and it pops up if you have the Apple store app installed. Like they use these uh, iBeacon technology in every single Apple store, Apple store, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. It's it's also like the thing where you're in the grocery store and it's like, are you near the end aisle? Get your Bud Light today kind of thing. But I feel like a lot of those, I mean, I, I used to work in marketing and I remember the iBeacon like I thought it was the most cool thing possible, but then it was like, okay, the actual, like you have to have somebody's app installed and stuff like that. Yeah. So I, this feels like the first time it's actually like a consumer level use and then tying it in with your smart home stuff or like any app on your phone is very cool. So it's just like for me, um, I've been experimenting with like a motion detector, which is, is great for like coming into my office, but I do want to have like a specific thing which is like NFC tags are doing it also where I could just tap the NFC tag that's right there. But just having it truly automatic, like you walk in and your phone's close enough to the beacon and it's like, okay, lights on, do this, all that jazz. So it, it should be fun. Yeah. Um, I definitely think I might have to pick up a couple of these and see <laughs> yeah, how they compare. Yeah, they're 20 bucks each. So I mean, so are the buttons, I guess. So. Uh, none, none of this is like incredibly cheap right now, but yeah. I want to see how they compare to the room made devices that I have because it's essentially the yeah. same technology, but used in a different exactly. way, uh, broadcasting Apple's, uh, techniques. Alrighty. Uh, we do have, uh, some, some questions here. So I thought we could go through these right quick. Um, sure. 
Alan, this Alan, not you are not Alan, but Alan asks a question specific <laughs> for you. My brother's name is Alan, so that's maybe it's weird. your brother. I Alan assume it, I him. assume it's not. But <laughs> uh, maybe it is. Maybe it's not. I'm In like you can case, just text me. <laughs> right. Uh, Alan asks. I was trying to set up a shortcut to set my alarm on when I leave the house and to turn it off when I come back. It appears that shortcuts cannot do this, although it allows me to set it up. Am I correct in assuming mm-hmm. that shortcuts do not work with location options when you leave and return to the house? Help me, Matthew Casanelli. You're my only hope. It doesn't sure. say that last part. That was just my <laughs> addition. Uh, I assume he also means like the home alarm, not like his bedtime alarm or something. Like, oh, see, logically, I was that thinking wouldn't... bedtime alarm. Yeah, I don't, I'm not sure because it could like... Oh, turning your alarm on yeah. when you leave the Why would you? Yeah, yeah. okay. Exactly. See, I, I misread like, uh, this. That's like, why it was a question alarm. for you and not for me. Now I understand. But it's it's still, um, I think probably what he's running into is it can be slightly confusing with, I mean, in general, Shortcuts has personal automations and then home automations, which do, uh, those are basically the home app automations that just show up in Shortcuts. And I think the reason they put them both in the Shortcuts app, even is what I was saying before, the convert to shortcut feature in home automations which lets you like do things like uh make certain types of web requests or use like if and the weather stuff to have conditions for your automations all of that stuff is totally separate from the actions that shortcuts can use itself um it is almost like more confusing that they're in there but um what he's experiencing is that the location triggers for personal automations in shortcuts don't actually allow you to run stuff in the background um this is a kind of this is one of the most the most frequent complaints i've seen about automations in shortcuts in ios 13 is that time-based location or time-based triggers location triggers and then um bluetooth type triggers don't or wi-fi you have to run them manually they don't actually automatically run which is like the name is automations and then they don't run automatically with that stuff so when when you're using its time of day location or bluetooth or wi-fi you have to run it from the notification and the only indication also is that there's like a little arrow there on the um notification that you can see so like a bunch of people it looks like it ran but it didn't do anything when really it's just a notification telling you to run it um so unfortunately, I don't think what he's trying to do will work sp- specifically as a personal automation. If it is a home alarm that's a home kit enabled, it could be done through a home automation, which uses, um, it has like the whole presence detection of whether you're at home and that stuff can run anytime. I think the biggest thing, like this is all probably confusing, but the thing that I always saw with, um, the time-based automations or location automations is if they did run automatically, you would just be holding your phone and stuff would just start happening on it. And it's really confusing. Like nothing in iOS happens in any way without you confirming it. And they've locked this down more in recent years. Like if you tap on a phone number, now you have to press call. It won't just start calling them right away and stuff like that. Mm. Um, So I'm pretty sure... I'm, I don't, I have no idea. I would love to see actual time-based and location-based shortcut automations come in the future, but right now they're just notifications. And even like in my experience, I've set them up to run at certain times and to show the notification and then I can tap on it and run it and I don't use them because it's just like not actually automatic and I don't see the notification or something. Like they could, there's tweaks they can make to those notifications like making it custom text and stuff like that. But um, right now it's just kind of like not useful. And I think a lot of like the common sentiment that I see, especially on Reddit is um, (laughs) they're like, this is useless because if I can't actually do location, like that's why everybody loves NFC tag automations because those do run in the background and it's you intentionally like doing something, but it's like the most seamless one right now. So yeah, that was, that's what I would recommend is like this one, he should set an NFC tag near the door and then touch his phone to it as he goes out or something like that. That makes sense. And that's kind of, I mean, if you think about the way that many uh, alarm systems work that you subscribe to and all those, you have to type in a code or you have to use a little beeper. So it's not yeah. as if 
tapping a, a notification or tapping an NFC tag is adding anything more complicated to the experience. Um, I, uh, yeah, that's not a bad idea. This even follows back to like the um, episode from the developer of the Pushcut app is he was basically saying like, when you really want to make it truly, truly automatic, a lot of times you're like, well, I didn't want it to happen this one time. And it becomes like it breaks and falls down. And when you have like too much automation, suddenly you know, like, I mean, I have the motion sensor is a good one. It's like, it should be great. But then I like stayed like I took a nap in my office and then moved a little bit and all the lights turned on and something like that. Like there's, you can't always account for like this happens every time. So I feel like it probably is good that Apple didn't enable this for some people because you, people would have gone nuts and had stuff just firing off at all times. And I feel like it's not ready. Even maybe we're not ready for it or something. But. No, really. That's funny. <laughs> Apple um, knows best now. <laughs> yeah, oh, God, don't <laughs> they, say that. They like to think that. <laughs> please don't say that. Yeah, please. Oh, boy. I was joking. I swear was to God. He was a joke. It was a joke. Stop sending the email. No, 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 no. Quit it. Take your fingers off the keyboard. Send it. You just use the send Gmail shortcut. Yes. Oh, my God. <laughs> um, let me talk about my pick of the week here really quickly, um, and then we will talk about yours. So... I want to, this is kind of a throwback. This product's been around for a long time, but I use this uh, rather frequently despite the fact. So uh, this is called the iFrogs Sound Hub Sync. Um, for those of you watching, you can see that there. Otherwise, you can tap on the link in the show notes and see what it is. It's just a little tiny uh, device that has a power button and a plus and a minus button on the front. And it comes with a little, you can actually change out the case. I believe it came with three different cases and it's a magnet. And so I can easily just magnet this to somewhere on my person. So in this case, I put it on my jacket that I'm wearing right now. Mm -hmm. And uh, it comes off very easily. And it comes with a pair of headphones that are, they're sort of in-ear headphones. They come built right in. Uh, but you can unplug the headphones from it and treat this as a Bluetooth hub. So it like a is, remote? Or? No, no, as, as a wireless receiver. So okay. I can use my, I connect my phone to it, and I can plug any headphones that have a headphone jack into the top of it. So the way that huh. I use this is I have some Bose Quiet Comfort uh, in ear headphones, and they are old school. They are not Bluetooth, they're not wireless. They plug into my current phone uh, with the little headphone jack to lightning connector, but they don't have to do that because I have the sound hub. So yeah. I simply plug them into the top of the sound hub and then. You plug I, in the headphone jack into this device. Into the device. And then I can turn on the, the um, noise cancellation feature. And I sort of tuck yes. all of that in my pocket. And then my phone connects to the sound hub. And it plays the music that I want to listen to without any chords between the two. Um, it's almost like reverse AirPods or something. Yeah. Where it's, it's like... Cause so, so the phone is sending the audio signal to this device to this little and then device. that device is just like has an outlet or a headphone jack that you, you plug yeah. into. So, so Precisely. it is like the benefit of wireless headphones with wired with whatever headphones. Whatever headphones you want to use. You're like wired to your person. It's like, yeah. um, well, even just like I'm in video world, uh, lav mics kind of. It's yeah, like, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That's nice. a perfect way to put it. Yeah. Um, and then it also, uh, so it, it charges very easily. Um, it's USB. What is it? Micro, um, and charges pretty quickly would be the thing and, and has quite a, a long battery life, but yeah, I can use, it also has a little mic so you can use it as a speakerphone for your uh, phone if you want to, but I can plug whatever I want in here so I can pull out my really nice, nice over ear headphones yeah, that's what I was thinking. and be cleaning my house while my phone doesn't have to be coming along in the pocket with me as I'm up and down and all around. Um, it is available on Zag's website uh, right now. It's half off uh, for $24. Uh, so a little bit under half off because it's normally 50. They do have it on Amazon, but I noticed that there are uh, fewer of the products available on Amazon. Um, and so I don't know if they're about to go out of stock or if, uh, Zag is thinking about updating them. Um, 
But I do know that, and they're available there for $50, but if you get them directly from Zag, from iFrogs, you mm. can get them for $23.99. Uh, so yeah, I think the headphones that come with it, meh, not great, obviously. Yeah. The thing that this is good for is to have, to basically make wired headphones into wireless headphones um, because yeah, you simply awesome. plug them into this and then you're good to go. So it's really nice to have that wireless option for a set of headphones that I love or earphones that I love, my Bose QC 20 something or whatever they are, um, <laughs> and have those on the go should I choose. Nice. Uh, yeah. So what is your pick of the week, Matthew? Well, hold on. I was just going to say, I I definitely just ordered a pair. Yeah, nice. It's like a, the the headphone technology Apple doesn't want you to know about. <laughs> uh, so my pick is HomePass for HomeKit, which is a fairly simple app, but is something that I recently ran into where once you have a certain number of HomeKit devices where the primary method of pairing is a little code that you scan on the physical device, it's really annoying to go back and repair all of those devices, especially when the code is like I have uh, the Eve door sensors and it's mounted on my door where I can't scan that code again. So this app is basically you can just type in all of your HomeKit codes and then automatically generate a QR code that then you can scan again later into the Home app and stuff like that. Um, I think it, I don't think I've actually rescan them so i think you might just tap it in there or use a different device or something like that um but it's basically just a simple uh, the reason i wanted to mention this too is i've mentioned um home pass or home run in the past before sorry home run <laughs> <laughs> not and then there's also home pass but there's a whole bundle he also makes um uh, let's see, home scan, which lets you use like Bluetooth proximity, which I got to see if this works with my um, iBeacon yeah. because that's the type of thing you use for that. And then home cam for HomeKit, which also has um, an Apple TV app. So you can go through all of your different video camera feeds and just check them through this app. And uh, he, the developer, Aaron Pierce, does like great work. Um, it's been cool. I've basically just been following him on Twitter for a while and seen him developing these ideas, which is now going to benefit me because it was it was one of those apps that I didn't need at all until I definitely did and now <laughs> I need it so I'm glad to have this because I just got like seven new Eve things all with HomeKit codes so it's like oh god I have to keep track of this somehow yeah it's nice this bundle that's available um, to basically get all of the the different services I am uh, I've got HomePass HomeCam HomeScan and Home Run now. Uh, to, to have all of those at, at not very much money is quite nice. Yeah, 10 bucks for all four, which is nice. It's like he's an independent developer too, so I'm totally happy Always to... Always on board for that, for sure. Yeah, exactly. To help out. All right. I feel like we're paying for the next app that he's making too or something Yes, like that. exactly. <laughs> Uh, well, folks, if you have questions, if you have feedback, if you have anything you want answered, whatever, you email us. It's stt. Of course, that stands for Smart Tech Today at twit.tv. We record the show live every Monday at 7 p.m. Eastern. That's 4 p.m. Pacific, which is 2300 UTC. If you head to twit.tv slash live, that will give you a place to go whenever the show's live to see uh, us on all the different platforms that are available. And if you head to twit.tv slash STT, then you can get access to the show's feed and subscribe and all sorts of different apps. But whether you want to see it in audio or video, all of those links are right there. Very easy to tap on or click on, depending on where you are. Uh, Matthew Casanelli, if folks want to follow you online and see the cool, awesome work that you're doing, how can they do so? <laughs> uh, you can check out MatthewCasanelli.com, which is freshly redesigned. I updated from the 2019 default WordPress theme to the 2020 default theme. <laughs> so I'm Ooh. master of web design. It actually looks really good. Like they did a very good job with the defaults the last two years. So it I has that new blog like, smell. I don't want to think about it anymore. I'm just going to get it published out there. So yeah, nice. check out my stuff there. And I do have a whole collection of shortcuts and home automations and things like that that you can check out in the menu bar up there. Beautiful. 
All right. Well, you can find me online at Micah Sargent on pretty much everything. I do try to claim that very unique, uh, very original username. Uh, you can also head to chihuahua.coffee. That's C-H-I-H-U-A-H-U-A.coffee, which has links to all the different places I say things and post things online, as well as uh, my work, uh, past, present, and future. Not future. Not future. That doesn't make sense. <laughs> past and present. Uh, and we, yeah, we thank you for uh, coming and hanging out with us or, you know, subscribing to the show and, and listening to us later on. This has been another episode of Smart Tech Today. So it's time to say goodnight to all your smart assistants. I'm pressing the button to turn off the lights. Oh, nice. <laughs> they they turned off well. here too. Whoa. Oh, God. <laughs> that button is too powerful, Matthew. <laughs> <laughs> Take it back. That's why it came with no battery. It was there, too powerful. Back on. There we go. Aha! Ah, Thank it you. Works. <laughs> <laughs>